Right, hello and welcome to this video where I'll be discussing the three batching paradigms that you can use with large language models and like anything that's request based and requires accessing a server, I suppose. So we have static batching, dynamic batching and continuous batching. Of course, there is the outlier example, which is just no batching, which means that you process like one sequence at a time and very briefly, at least in this article, which I'm referring to in this video, static batching is essentially just, sorry, um, no batching is if you're doing like testing and you want to debug or you're like developing, but if you're doing anything at a production level, then you have to use some level of batching. So I didn't know what that sound was. So first let's start off with static batching. And I'm going to go with an analogy in this video. So first of all, with static batching, you have a bus. And in this case, the driver waits for the bus to fill entirely and then drives off to the destination once it's full and only when it's full. So this confusing diagram is understandable once you get the context. So in this case, we have a batch size of four. So if we're talking about large language models, then we have four sequences. And for static batching, at least for this request, it had immediately four requests. So it went at time step one and then time step two, four requests. Time step three, it had two requests. And then four, five, six, it still didn't go. Um, seven, eight. So it had to wait, I guess, five or six time steps until it actually completed the job. And this is because in static batching, we do not wait, or we do wait until the batch size has been reached and then we will um, complete the task. And dynamic batching seeks to solve this problem where you literally have like two batches idle waiting for two other to come, where it's a maximum mm, of two values. So in dynamic batching, we still have our max of four for the batch size, but then we also have the max latency, which in this case would be like 100 milliseconds. So it's the max of the seconds or the, mm, or I guess the minimum. It's the minimum of the request. No, it is the maximum. Sorry about that. Of the number of requests and the milliseconds. So as soon as we pass 100 milliseconds, then the batch goes. So in this case, you can see that we only have a batch of size two in this case, a batch of size two in this case, and a batch of size three because we've already passed 100 milliseconds. If you, I guess you assume that each it each iteration here or each request is 50 milliseconds in length, then two would be 100 milliseconds. But then in some cases where we do have uh, a full batch size in only 50 milliseconds, then we'll not wait for that and we'll just take the max, which is uh, four batches in our se four sequences in our batch and go ahead. So dynamic batching is good for this reason that we no longer have the issue of waiting for um, the batch to become full. However, it's only really applicable or um, makes sense when each request takes equal time because if you have three requests that are really fast and the fourth, which is really slow, then you'll be at some point having released all three tasks, all three of the first sequences that are fast and still waiting for the fourth task to finish before you can open up the queue for more mm, requests or sequences into the model. So this is not good for transformers, for example, where you have varying sequence lengths, but if you're looking at like diffusion and image generation, where it is a constant amount of time relatively to cr create images since it's like the same dimension and same parameters, then dynamic batching is very uh, viable. Just if there is like a slowest link type of formulation, especially if we're talking about transformers, the example they give is like you have a chain of thought response that's really fast and then, I'm sorry, that's really long versus a very quick response, yes or no, like these are possibilities with the same model. In that case, it's not recommended. And then now we're going to talk about continuous batching, which is, I guess, the state of the art. Uh, uh, what, the, what is it called? VLLM and TensorR TLLM use continuous batching. So just before we go to that, let's review. Individual request is like the worst, where you have just one request at a time. And then static batching is not shown here, but we all saw it over here. Then dynamic batching, you have, in this case, I guess they have batches with all sequence size of four, they instead just choose to emphasize that as soon as you have like this slowest length, longest one, then you can only set the next batch until that one's finished. And then now continuous batching. So it works at the token level instead of the request level. 
And this means that finished sequences are replaced with new ones immediately as they're done because um, each iteration represents one new token generation. And what this does it, is it maximizes GPU utilization since we're not waiting for the longest sequence to become complete. And in continuous batching, you still need to specify your max batch size, which in this case is four. So even though it's continuous, you mm, still need to specify this batch size. And then when it comes to the anticipated sequence shapes, so like the sequence length, this is also helpful to specify. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly why the detail here is. But if you look at dynamic batching, for example, you definitely need to specify the sequence size because, like, your model can only fit a specific context length. So just keep that in mind. But that's not as important. And how it works is that it takes the last token of each sequence and the KV catch for that one to process them in parallel. So, for example, we have these four sequences. At each time step, we have our KV cache, which contains the keys and values for all of the previous tokens within our context. And then we take the last generated token, compute the new key and value, which gives us the query vector. And then we use the query vector to get the context vector. And then this is fed through the feed forward neural network, uh, which is then done through the amount of transform blocks that you have. And this gives us the next token. And then we repeat that process again. So this is kind of the end-to-end -end layout. And what also this allows you to do is to kind of load the transformer blocks and parameters sequentially. So you can load the first transformer block, uh, perform, I guess the transformer blocks are the same, but they have different weights. So never mind, they're not the same. You load the first transformer block with all of those weights, perform the operations within the transform block on all four tokens. Since they're independent, we can do this in parallel since there are four independent sequences, four independent batches, and then do this once more. And as soon as one sequence has reached its uh, end of sequence token, then we immediately put another sequence in and we start the same process. So you can kind of see that because we're framing this on the token level, it's much more useful and we can prevent a situation like this where we have dead space in our batch graph. So yeah, that's pretty much all of the information in this video. I didn't really see that many good explanations online, so hopefully this will help you, and feel free to refer to this article if you'd like more details.